Okay, so for today's video, we are going to discuss um, the paper one, paper one two, okay, for the May June 2021 session. Right, okay, so for question number one, they want us to express this quadratic expression into the completing square form. Okay, so before we completing a square for a quadratic expression, what we need to do is actually we need to factorize out the coefficient of x squared first. And for the constant, I will just keep it as a constant. I don't uh, factorize out the 16. And after that, we will try to simplify okay, the terms that we have here. So you have 3 over 2x. And now we want to add the b over 2 square and minus b over 2 square. So this is my b. All right, negative 3 over 2 is the b. Therefore, when I want to complete in the square, I will have 3 over 4 square and minus 3 over 4 square. Then the plus 10 is outside. Okay. After that, I will combine the first three terms here, become a big bracket. All right, so I'm, ha I'm having 16. And then x minus 3 over 4 square. Then I expand this term, which is 9 over 16 plus 10. Okay, so the minus here follow the sign for this one. Okay, so this is minus. And after that, 16, I will multiply into the both terms, into the first term and into the second term. So when I expand it, I will have 16 x minus 3 over 4 square minus 9 plus 1. Okay, so again, if I look at the question that you request, uh, we actually need to put the 4 into the bracket of the square. Therefore, I need to rephrase the 16 become 4 square x minus 3 over 4 square plus 1. Okay, all right, so from here, you can see that uh, we are having both same power for the 4 and also the bracket. So when they're having the same power, then we can actually multiply into the terms, into the bracket, okay, into both terms. In, in the bracket and therefore we will have 4x minus 3 square plus 1. And you can see that this is actually the pattern that you want us to express, which is 4x plus a square plus b. So we are having the pattern that they want us to show. Alright, so this is what we have for part a. Okay, then now we can go to the part b. Okay, so for part number B, they give us this equation again, and then where k is a constant has exactly one root, they want us to find the value of this root. Okay, so when you want to have the equation that has exactly one root, actually we need to do something. Okay, so we will start from this equation first. Okay, so we are having 16x squared minus 24x plus 10 equals to k. And I realized that this expression is actually the expression that we completing square in the first part. So I'm trying to put the answer in the first part and substitute into part number b. So for x minus 3 square plus 1 equals to k. And I try to link how can I get only one root. Okay, so if I want to get the root for this equation, right, generally I need to move all the numbers to one side. Okay, and if I want to have only one root, if I want to have only one root, it means that this particular value, this whole thing, must be equal to zero. When k minus one equals to zero, when you take the square root over and when you take all the number over, you will have only one value for the x. If this value is not a zero, when you move everything over, the x will have two different values. All right, so again, to fulfill the request that we have only one root here, we will let this equal this whole thing equals to zero. Which means that, we will have 4x 
minus 3 square equals to 0. If you take square root, you will have 0 as well. And eventually, you will have the value of x, which is 3 over 4. So this is how we actually get the answer for this part number B. Alright, so now we come to question number 2. Okay, so for question number 2, we can see that we have an original function fx, and then we want to transform it into 2fx minus 1. So they want us to write out two single transformations we have been combined to give the resulting transformation. Alright, so the first transformation that we are going to look at is this one, where we are having a negative 1 inside the bracket of fx. So inside the bracket of fx, it is actually a, a, transfer, a, a translation. When you're having a positive or negative sign, okay, a, a positive or negative value, right, adding in either inside the basic function or outside the basic function, generally it will be a translation. So this is actually a translation. And then we need to mention also in what direction. So it is actually in the x direction, or you can write it out as uh, in the horizontal direction also can. So the direction is important because direction, the translation can apply for both directions, either the x or either the y. So for our example here, it is inside the basic function, therefore it should be in the x direction. With uh, how many units are you translating the graph? So it will be with one unit. And then what is the direction? Horizontal direction, it can be go, going to the left or going to the right. So uh, it is actually to the right side for this case. Okay, so if you're having a plus one inside the basic function, then only it will be to the left, all right? So this is the first transformation that we go through. And the second transformation will be this one. We multiply a two outside the basic function. So when you multiply a two outside the basic function, it is a stretch. And outside the basic function means that it will be in the y direction. So you can write out as a stretch in y direction or y axis with a stretch factor, what's the value for the stretch factor? So the scale factor, so where the stretch factor 2? Because you multiply the 2 outside the basic function, and therefore the graph, uh, the value of y will be affected by multiplying 2 in our graph or, or in our equation. Okay, then now we go to the part number b. Okay, so for part number b, they are telling us that this is the equation of y, the curve y is reflected in the x uh, in the y axis and then stretched by a scale factor of 1 over 3 in the x direction so they want us to write down the equation of the transform curve okay so our original equation is y equals to sine 2x minus 5x okay so when we are having this when we are having the reflected in the y-axis, it means that from fx, if I'm having fx, uh, I'm going to change it become f negative x. Okay, so for the reflected in the y-axis means that it is the left-right reflection. For left-right reflection means y-axis is the mirror or is the reflection line, and therefore the function should be f. We put the negative with the x. Alright, so the same thing happened when we have the equation here. The first step is we need to change it become y equals to sine. The x we will change it become negative x. So you can see that the x I replace it by negative x. 5 also, the x I need to replace it by negative x. Okay, so I will write it again. I will have negative 2x plus 5. Okay, so if you want, you can actually pull the negative out from the sine function. If you don't want, then you can just remain it like this. So after the first transformation, I will have y equals to sine negative 2x plus 5. And after that, we proceed to another one, another trans, uh, transform transformation, where it is stretched by a scale factor 1 over 3 in the x direction. Okay, so when we are having the stretch by x direction, means that now 
I assume that this is gx already. Lah. After you transfer everything, it becomes gx. And now we need to reflect it. Uh, we need to have a stretch. We have to stretch it uh, with a scale factor in x direction. So the changing part uh, or maybe the modified part is in, inside the bracket also, inside the basic function. So they are having stretch by scale factor 1 over 3. That means they have to do something with the x inside. Uh. So the scale factor is 1 over 3. But when you, multi when you put it inside the bracket, it will be the opposite. So that means it will be multiplied with 3x. If a scale factor 1 over 2, then it will become 2x. All right, okay. So we are having g3x. So that means from the x here, you need to change it, become 3x in your new function. So now we will continue further from our answer. So for this part, I want to replace all the x by using negative, oh sorry, by using 3x. So negative 2, I copy. I will replace the x become 3x. Sorry, I make a mistake here. Here should have an x just now. All right, I miss out. Okay, then plus 5. And again, I need to replace the x by using 3x. So if I rephrase and simplify everything again, then I'm having negative 6x plus 15x. So this is the equation that I have after the second transformation. Or if you want, you can rewrite again. Since we know that sine negative 6x is equal to negative sine 6x, then plus 15x. So you can leave your answer in any of this. Alright, so both are accepted. Okay, so this is how we actually go through the transformation by changing the uh, equation all right according to the transformation that they, they, they mentioned all right let us discuss question number three okay we have an equation given by uh, given like this huh? so there's the following points lies on the curve non-exact values are rounded to four decimal places so you can see that for us right we are having 2k then this one and so on so all these are the points and it is worth for us to discover that um, all the x coordinate right that we try to figure out or uh, it is listed in the question they are actually getting closer and closer to the x coordinate of 3 so they want us to find the k giving the answer correct to four decimal places so if you look at this k here, generally it is actually the value of y nah, when our x is equal to 2. So for the first question, it is very straightforward. To get the value of k, what do we need to do is like we just substitute the 2 into our equation where you are having 2 minus 3, then square root 2 plus 1 and plus 3. Okay, so by pressing the calculator, we will have the value for k 1.2679 correct to four decimal places and therefore our k which is the value of y when x equals to 2 so it will be equals to 2679 okay so this is our first question and now we continue to the second question okay so for the second question here part b they want us to find the gradient of AE giving your answer correct to four decimal places. So to get the gradient of AE, so the gradient formula will be y1 minus y2. So you can use A as y1, E as y2, or uh, the other way around also can. So maybe for me, I will use E as y1, this one as y2. So y1 minus y2 means 3 minus 1.2679. This is y1 minus y2 divided by x1 minus x2, 3 minus 2. So from here, we will get the value for the gradient, which is 1.7321. And this is the gradient for AE. Okay, then now we proceed to the third part. Okay, so for part number C, they are saying that the gradient of BE, so just now we found the gradient for AE, right? K 
Okay, then now they are mentioning that the gradient for BE, CE and DE rounded to four decimal places are all this value. Okay, so they want us to state one reason for the answer, what the values of the four gradients suggest about the gradient of the curve at the point E. Okay, so of course we need to try and observe like, all the uh, answer that we get. Okay, so the gradient for AE is 1.7321. Okay, and after that, the gradient for BE is 1.9748. So what is the B? B is getting closer to the X coordinate 3, right? Just now it's 2, then 2.9, 2.99, 2.99, and 3. So when we observe the X coordinate and also their gradient with the E, right? You can see that the gradient also getting closer and closer to a particular number. So from 1.7321 to 1.9748 to 1.9975 to 1.99997. So these values are getting closer to value 2. Okay, so that's the first information that we can observe uh, from the result given. So maybe what you can do is that like you can try to write out the observation first that we get here. So the gradients AE, BE, CE, and DE, the values are getting closer. to the value 2. Okay, and what does it mean? It means that if let's say we continue to figure out the points that's getting very, very, very close to x equals to 3, right? Then the gradient will be very, very, very close to 2. Okay, so eventually we can actually um, conclude that all right, the gradient of the curve at the point E, which is the dy dx right, at point E, will be actually equals to 2. So you can write out like this, where the gradient two is the gradient of the curve. At point E. Okay, so how can we observe this? Actually, because of you can see that when the points, okay, for all the x coordinate and the points are huh, are getting closer and closer to the particular point E, right? We can observe that the gradient also uh try trying to converge or getting closer to one particular value, which is the two. So we can actually expect that when the changing the changes is small enough, all right, therefore the gradient of the particular point E on the curve will be actually the two. All right, so this is what we can observe and what we can write up uh, as a conclusion. Okay, then now we are at question number four. So we have the expansion of this one, and they tell us that the coefficient of x in this expansion is p okay so the coefficient of 1 minus uh, 1 over x in this expansion is q okay so given that p equals to 6q they want us to find the possible values of k okay all right so now we will start from the very first uh, part first information given in the question so for this particular expansion right okay uh, they said the coefficient of x is p. Okay, so I will focus on this expansion first. So for x uh, plus 10 over x power 3. Okay, I want to try to get the term with the x power 1. So I will have 3c something for x power something and then 10 over x power something. Okay, so we need to try to... Uh, try to investigate a little bit on ourselves to have x to have power x right and the total power should be a 3 generally we should observe that 
if this is power 2 and this is power 1, the result or the outcome that we have will be x power 1. Okay, so we can, you can try and error by using some simple try and error technique. Okay, and the total for the power here must be equal to 3. So 2 plus 1 equals to 3. So for this one, if you expand it, you will have x power 2. Then for this one, you have something with 1 over x. So when you simplify them, you will have the coefficient. You will have the term with x power 1. Okay, all right. So this is how we, uh, I try to, I try, I, I'm try, I get the value by using the try and error method. So simple try and error method. Now. So what you having here is I will have 3C1. Okay, so this is the term that I want to figure out. So when I try to press calculator for 3C1, 3C1 I think is a 3. Then multiply with 4x squared, it will be 16x squared. 10 over x will be 10 over x power 1, right? So still the same. Okay, so you try to combine okay, all the numbers together and also simplify the x. Then you are having 480x. So in the question, they mentioned that the coefficient of x is p. So that means our p should be 480. The 480 is our coefficient of x. Therefore, from here, very easily you can make a conclusion that p is actually equals to 480. And now, they are mentioning that p equals to 6q actually. So that means 6q is also equals to 480. And the Q that we have here should be 80. Okay, so this is uh, important information that we are going to use it, uh, okay, later in the second part. So you can see the second sentence here. The coefficient of 1 over x in the expansion of this one is a Q. Okay, so eventually they want us to find the value of K. Alright, so now... We will, call for, uh, we will focus on this second part, the second expansion here. So this is the second expansion that we have. So we are having 2x plus k over x squared power 5. Okay, and I want to get the 1 over x, the term with 1 over x. Okay, so again, I'm having 5c something, 2x power something k over x squared power something okay so again i want to have the coefficient of 1 over x so which means that if this is power 1 then this one must be power 3 oh sorry they want 1 over x right okay so if let's say this is power 1 so that means this one must be power 1 also okay so 1 this one is x, then this one is 1 over x squared. So when you simplify it, you will get 1 over x. But too bad if you investigate the total of the power, it is not equal to 5. So that means power 1 and power 1 is not the correct answer for this. Okay, then you can try and error again. So if let's say I'm having a power 2 here, then this one must be power 3 for me to get 1 over x. Okay. Because if you look at this one, if you expand this, you have x power 3. Then if you expand this one, you have 1 over x power 4. So x power 3 multiplied with x power 4, you get 1 over x. Then you double check with the power here. Power 3 plus power 2 is equal to power 5. So that means that this particular power is the correct answer that I want to look for. Okay, so the power, after you decide the power, then the 5c here will be 5c2 or 5c3 also can but you still will follow the term at the back. Okay, no matter 5C2 or 5C3, the answer is actually the same. Okay, so once you decide the value already for the expansion, then you can try to put in all the details. So what is the value for 5C2? 5C2 will be 10. Then multiply with 2 power 3, so 8. So you're having 8x power 3. Then for this one, you're having k square power over x power 4. Okay, then when you try to simplify everything here, right, you have 80k square equals uh, divided by x. Alright, so from here, we can see that the coefficient of 1 over x is actually 80k square. So that means the coefficient is 80k square, it is equal to q given in the question. 
So that means Q is equals to 80K squared. And just now, in the first part, we already know the value of Q, right? So Q is actually 80. So 80 equals to 80K squared. So to get the value of K, you need to move all the number to the other side. So your K actually has two values, which is K equals to 1 and also K equals to negative 1. Okay, so this is how we solve uh, this question number 4. Okay, so now we come to question number 5. Okay, they give us the function where the domain of the function is x greater or equals to 0. They want us to find the simpli find and simplify the expression for f composite f. Okay, so we will start from f composite f function. They want us to simplify. Okay, so f composite f will be, first you are having the function f which is 2x squared plus 3, right? And you want to put the 2x squared plus 3 into your function f again. So 2, x squared means 2x squared plus 3 squared. The x in our original equation become the 2x squared plus 3, okay? Then you still have a plus 3 at the back, All right? Okay, then now we can try to expand and simplify it. So to expand the square, I'm having 4x power 4, 12x square plus 9, and then plus 3. Okay, so 8x power 4 plus 24x square plus 18 plus 3. So from here, you will get something like this. It is actually the quadratic form equation in terms of x squared. Okay, so this is what we have for the first part where they want us to get the ffx. Okay, then now we proceed to the part number b. Okay, so for part number b, they want us to solve this particular equation. Okay, so to solve the particular equation here, ffx equals to 34x squared plus 19. So we already found the ffx just now, right, in first part. Okay, so I will substitute the answer in first part to the second part here. And then we continue to solve it. Okay, so my ffx is actually 8x power 4 plus 24x squared plus 21. It is equal to 34x squared plus 19. Okay. Then now I try to simplify everything here. I'm having x, 8x power 4, then uh, negative 10x squared plus 2, which is equal to 0. Okay, we can further simplify it where we are having at, uh, 4x power 4 minus 5x squared plus 1 equals to 0. Okay, so it is a quadratic form equation in terms of x squared, right? like what I mentioned just now. So you can actually try to factorize it. Okay, I'm having 4x squared and x squared here for first term. Second term will be all the 1. Then to get the negative 5, I need to minus for both. That equals to 0. Okay, so from here, I'm having x squared equals to 1 over 4. x squared equals to 1. Okay. Then if I continue here, I will have x, which is equal to the plus minus of 1 over 2. x will be equal to plus minus of 1. Okay, and then we are having four values here. And again, if we refer back to the domain given in the question, right, they are restricting the x, which is greater or equal to 0. That means we need to consider this domain in our answer as well. So we only want to consider the answer which is x greater or equals to 0. Alright, so that means we ignore the two negative value here, the negative half, and also the negative 1. Why we ignore them? Because it is given that the x must be greater and equals to 0. Therefore, the final answer for this particular question here, the x should be only 1 over 2 and also the value of 1. So we only consider these two values as our answer.
Okay, so now we come to question number six. All right, so we have point A and point B with these coordinates, and after that, the, the equation of the perpendicular bisector of AB is y equals to two, negative 2x two plus 4. So uh, they want us to calculate the values for P and also the Q. Okay, so here, generally, um, we are having the perpendicular bisector equation, uh, which is y equals to negative, two, negative 2x plus 4. Okay, so maybe at first, uh, I would like to find out the gradient of AB first. Okay, so the gradient of AB will be equals to um, P, oh, sorry, Y, right? So it should be Q. So Q minus 3 divided by P minus 8. All right? Okay, so this is my gradient of AB. And for the perpendicular bisector, right? For the perpendicular bisector, the gradient for perpendicular bisector is negative 2. This is the gradient for the perpendicular bisector, okay, for the perpendicular line, which is equals to negative 2. So it means if I'm having the gradient of AB multiplied with this perpendicular gradient, it will be equals to 1. So I'm using this concept here. The gradient of AB multiply the gradient of the perpendicular line equals to negative 2. Oh, sorry, equals to negative 1. Okay, so the gradient of AB will be Q minus 3 divided by P minus 8 multiply with half, uh, multiply with negative 2 and it will be equals to negative 1. Okay, so from here we can see that Q minus 3 divided by P minus 8 it is equals to half. Alright, so uh, I will want to try to simplify it further. So to simplify it further, I will have Q minus 3 equals to half P minus 4. Okay, so I further simplify, I will have half P minus 1. So to me, this is the first equation that I get from the information provided in the question. Okay, so this is about the gradient. And after that, we need to find out a second equation uh, so that we can solve the simultaneous equation to get the value for P and also to get the value for Q. And since this question, they are talking about perpendicular bisector. So which means that if let's say you're having the line A and line B, this particular line, this particular line actually pass through the midpoint of AB. Okay, therefore, uh, we can try to find out the midpoint of AB and after that, I substitute it into the equation. So what is the midpoint for AB here? It will be 8 plus P divided by 2 and also 3 plus Q divided by 2. And this midpoint will pass through the perpendicular bisector. Therefore, I can substitute this x to x and this y coordinate as the y into our equation for the perpendicular bisector. So I'm having y equals to negative 2x plus 4. So y is 3 plus q over 2 equals to negative 2, 8 plus p over 2 as well. Okay, then plus 4. All right, so from here, I would like to simplify everything slowly. Okay, I'm having, uh, maybe for the whole equation, I try to multiply by 2. Uh. This one can be cancelled off already. So when I multiply everything by 2, generally I'm having 3 plus q equals to negative 16 minus 2p then plus 8. Right? Okay, so if I try to simplify, this is what I will get. And after that, I will have q which is equals to Mm, negative 8 minus 3, I get negative 11, then minus 2p. So this is my second equation. I try to solve the simultaneous equation here. Alright, so I'm having half p minus 1 equals to 
negative 11 minus 2p. Okay, then I try to simplify everything here. Uh, 5 over 2p equals to negative 10. And therefore, my p is actually equals to negative 4. So once you get the p equals to negative 4, then you can substitute it into the uh, q equation. Okay, either one, either equation number 1 or either equation number 2, then you will get the value of q, where it should be equals to negative 3. Alright, so from this question, right, generally when they give us the uh, formula for the perpendicular bisector, you can use the information about the perpendicular gradients and also the midpoint, okay, to form two different equations and we solve it simultaneously. So the final answer for P and Q will be negative 4, where the Q should be equal to negative 3. Okay, question number 7. Um, we have a point, point A with this coordinate and the line has the gradient negative 2 over 3 pass through the A. And then the circle has a center of this and also the radius of square root 52. So first they want us to show that the line is actually the tangent to the circle at A. Alright, so um, generally what they want us to prove is this one. So we are having a circle and they want us to prove that at this point A, the line L is actually the tangent for A. This is line L, and this particular point is the A. Okay, so how can you prove that um, the line is the tangent to the circle at A? Generally, um, we need to prove. Okay, the first one is when we are having the tangent to the circle, right? At a certain point, we must prove that they are 90 degrees to each other. Okay, then uh, if we prove that this is 90 degrees to each other, at least we know that, okay, we are having a tangent at the circle, uh, at the point A from the circle. All right? Okay, yeah, so you should prove the first one. So the first one, we are going to prove that the gradient of center and A, so maybe I will let C center is a center all right so let the center as a c so c is equals to one ah oh, sorry one five not one five the circle the center of the circle is five eleven okay so first i want to find out the gradient of c a so the gradient of c a will be eleven y one minus y two minus five divided by five minus one so we are having six over four which is equal to 3 over 2. Okay, and then now if we try to figure out the gradient of CA multiply with the gradient of the line, what will I get? So I will have 3 over 2 multiply with the gradient of line, which is negative 2 over 3, and therefore you have a negative 1. So you know that CA is actually perpendicular with the line L. So that's the first property that we should prove. Lah. Okay, after you prove that they are 90 degrees to each other, right? When we say that uh, if they are 90 degrees to each other from C A to L, it can be the L like here. And this is the A. We can only prove that they are 90 degrees to each other. Lah. So how can I prove that it is actually the tangent at the circle? So to prove that it is the tangent at the circle, we need to show that the distance from the center to the point A should be equal to the radius. Alright, so we will want to find out the distance of CA. So to find the distance of CA, again, we use x minus x squared plus y minus y squared. Okay, and we will have 16 plus 36 and we are having the square root of 52 so it is also equal to the radius of the circle okay so from here right we already know that ca is perpendicular with the line l at the same time also ca distance is equal to the radius of the circle so from here we can actually conclude that the line L is actually the tangent to the circle 
that date. All right, so after you make these two property and checking, then you can uh, make a conclusion. Uh, the line L is actually the tangent to the circle at A. Okay, so this is what we have for question number seven. All right, then now we continue to part number B in question number seven. Okay, so for part B, okay, so for part B, what do we have here is they want us to find the equation of the, the other circle, okay, with the same radius square root 52, for which the line L is also the tangent at A. Okay, so maybe for this question, I would try to draw it here. Okay, so they want us to find the equation of another circle of the radius, huh? also square root 52, lah, where it is also the tangent at A. So that means A will be also on the uh, on the circumference of another circle. Okay, so we can actually expect that I might have another circle where it will be something like this. Uh. Okay, so if let's say the circle is somewhere here, you can see that A is also on the circle and the line L is also the tangent of this particular circle. So they want us to find the equation of this circle, green color one. Alright, so to find the green color circle, you should know that Okay, the distance uh, from C, A, just now this is C, right? The first center is the C, from C to A, okay, from C to A, and also from, maybe this one I label it as B, lah, okay? So this is A just now, and then the, center, the new center is the B. Lah. So the C, A, and B, A should be have, having the equal distance because they are saying that the both circle are having the radius, which is square root 52. Okay, so which means in this case, A will be actually the midpoint, okay, for the C and also the B. Okay, all right, so now I want to find the B. Now. So B, I don't know what is it, it will be X and Y, but I know that A is actually the midpoint of BC. So A is midpoint of BC. <laughs> Therefore, my coordinate of A is actually 1, 5. And it is equal to midpoint of BC. So to calculate the midpoint of BC, you take x coordinate for B plus x coordinate for C divided by 2. Then the same thing happens for the y. So y plus 11 divided by 2. Okay, so from here you have x plus 5 divided by 2 equals to 1. And then y plus 11 divided by 2, it is equal to 5. Okay, so if you continue further, you will get the x coordinate, which is negative 3. The y coordinate, it will be the negative 1. So from here, you know that the center of the second circle is actually negative 3 and also y equals to negative 1. So to form the equation, the circle equation, it will be x plus 3 square. It should be x minus negative 3 square. So it becomes x plus 3 square and then plus y minus negative 1, so it becomes y plus 1 square, equals to the radius is still the same, right, for the second circle, so which is square root 52 square. So you can leave your answer like this, or you can rephrase it again, become x plus 3 square, y plus 1 square, equals to 52. Alright, so this is how we get the equation for the second circle by referring to the diagram here, okay? Alright, so now we come to question number 8. Uh, okay, so we have the arithmetic progression, first, second, and the third term, where it is A, 3 over 2A, and also the B, right? So where A and B are positive constants, so I think the word positive constants is important. 
Okay, and after that, the first, second, and third terms of a geometric progression are given as this one. And first, they want us to find the values of A and B. Okay, so you need to form some equation, all right, to solve and get the value for A and B. Okay, so you start to get one equation from AP, arithmetic progression first. Okay, so for the arithmetic progression, you're having first three terms, which is written like this. Okay, so which means that if I'm having 3 over 2a minus the a, this is actually the common difference, right? It will be also equals to b minus 3 over 2a. Alright, so the common difference equals to the common difference as well. So uh, if I try to bring the 2 over 3, oh sorry, 3 over 2a over, okay, become 3a minus a is equals to b. Alright, so the first equation that I can form is actually b equals to 2a. So this is the information that I get from the arithmetic progression. And after that, I go to the geometric progression. So for the geometric progression, generally I'm having, uh, I want to use the ratio, like the common ratio formula, where the second term divided by the first term is 18 over a should be equal to third term divided by second term. So I'll have b plus 3 divided by 18. Alright, so this is the second equation and I can try to solve simultaneous equation here. Alright, so if I con continue to simplify everything, then I'll have 324 a then b plus 3 and after that I'm having 324 equals to a and from just now we already have the b, b equals to 2a, right? So I substitute b equals to 2a, then plus 3. Okay, so if I continue to expand everything and rephrase it, I will have 3a, oh sorry, 2a squared plus 3a minus 324, and it is equals to 0. Okay, so next I will want to try and factorize it. So if I try it, I will have 2a and a, and then... 324, 324, I will have 27 and 12 uh, if you try, right? Or if, if you use the help to, of calculator. So I want to have plus 27 and minus 12. Okay, so continue from here. The value of A that I get will be negative 27 over 2. And another value will be A equals to 12. And of course, we are not going to consider Okay, the answer for a, which is equal to negative 22 over, uh, 27 over 2, because of uh, they give us a condition here where a should be a positive constant. So we only accept the value where a equals to 12. So once you know that a equals to 12, you try to substitute into the b equation. So you'll get the b, which is equals to 24. Alright, so this is how we actually get the value for a and also the value of b. A is equal to 12 and B equals to 24. Right. Okay. Then now if we proceed further. Okay. So when we go to the second part, part B, they want us to find the sum of the first 20 terms of the arithmetic progression. Okay. So to find the sum, okay, of the first 20 terms, first we need to know the A first, uh, first term. Okay, so for the arithmetic progression, if you look at the uh, information given just now, alright, A is the A, right? So A will be equals to 12. Okay, to get the D, the common difference, you are taking 3 over 2, A minus A, where you will realize that your D is actually equals to 1 over 2 times A. So the D is actually equal to 6. So these two values are important, A and also the D. And then all these are sufficient for us to find out the value for sum of the first 20 terms. First 20 terms. So to get the first 20 terms, it will be 20 and divided by 2, 2A plus N minus 1, which is 19. And the D, D will be the 6. 
Okay, so from here, um, we will get the answer, which is 1380. Okay, so now we come to question number nine. <clears throat> Alright, so for question number nine, um, we have a diagram, and then this diagram shows the equation y squared equals to x minus 2, the line y, uh, x equals to 5, and also the line y equals to 1. So we have the shaded region, okay, enclosed by all the curve and the lines here. And it is rotated through 360 degrees about the x axis. And we want to find out the volume obtained. Okay, so to get the volume obtained, Generally, we need to know that uh, because it is rotated about the x-axis, therefore, when you want to find out the volume, it should be integrate in dx. Uh. So, we are having volume. Okay, so to get the volume right, the formula will be pi y square dx. Okay, so we cannot use the dy because of here they already mentioned it is rotated 360 degrees about the x-axis. So, we have to use the dx here for the integration. Okay, and then now, um, because of the area is covered from this length, uh, sorry, from the value of x here until x equals to 5. So we actually want to know what is this value first before we can do the integration. Alright, so let us find out the x first. So when y equals to 1, what is the value of x? Okay, so we are having y squared equals to x minus 2. So when y equals to 1, what is the value of x here? So x will be equals to 3. Okay, so that means our area, shaded area is actually covered start from x equals to 3 until x equals to 5. Alright, so next, when you want to get the volume, right? Okay, we need to have this curve minus this line okay so when you want to get the volume it will be pi y square so pi y square this is the y square the first y square that we have therefore we're having pi and then the y square is x minus 2 dx okay and then from 3 until 5 for the limits and because you only want to cover you only want to consider the shaded region the volume for the shaded region only Therefore, um, we need to minus the volume, okay, which is formed by this rectangle area. Therefore, we actually need to minus. Uh, so we minus. Also, the area is covered from 0 until 5. We are still having the pi and then y squared. So for this line itself, generally it is y equals to 1. So y squared means 1 squared dx. Alright, so if you try to simplify and do the integration later, then we will successfully get the volume. Alright, so uh, first I will see that both term here, I'm having the pi. Therefore, I can take out the pi actually. The limit for integration are the same, so I can combine all of them together. It will become x minus 2 minus 1. So that means I only want to integrate the function which is or the expression which is x minus 3 okay so now when i do the integration integrate x it will become x squared over 2 integrate 3 you will have 3x and then 5 and 3 continue from here 5 squared you are having 25 over 2 then minus 15 then after that, you substitute in the 3. So 3 squared is a 9. 9 over 2 minus 9. Alright, so from here, if you try to simplify everything um, slowly, okay, then we should able to get the answer, which is 2, 5. Of course, if you want, you can change it, become 3 significant figure. So for me, I will just leave it in terms of so I will, my final answer will be 2 pi. Okay, so we come to question number 10. Right, so they want us to prove this identity. Okay, so for the left hand side, we are having two terms. And for the right hand side, we are having one term. So um, usually for me, I will suggest to start with the side with more terms. So like two terms combined become one term, it will be easier. Alright, 
Okay, so let me start from the left hand side. Okay, so for the left hand side, I'm having 1 plus sine x over 1 minus sine x. And then I'm having 1 plus sine x, 1 minus sine x. Okay, so because for my final answer on the right, huh, there's only one term. So I think uh, we should try. Okay, we should actually try to combine both terms together. So to combine both terms together become one, generally we need to make sure that we are having the same denominator. So that's why I multiply the, the denominator together. And then for this part, you are having 1 plus sine x multiplied with 1 plus, uh, 1 plus sine x, so which is 1 plus sine x squared. Then minus 1 minus sine x squared. Okay, and after that, <coughs> to simplify it, I will expand everything. So I'm having 1 plus 2 sine x plus sine square x minus 1 minus 2 sine x plus sine square x. Okay, then for the number, oh, sorry, for the denominator part, we are having 1 minus sine square x. Okay, so we simplify it further. We are having 1 minus 1 cancel off with each other. So 2. Okay, so 2 plus 2 sine x and having 4 sine x. And after that, sine x minus sine square x, sine square x minus sine square x becomes 0. So my numerator only left 4 sine x. So for the denominator part, 1 minus sine square x, when I try to simplify, I will have cos square x. Okay, and after that, we try to separate everything out. Cos square can be written as cos x multiplied with cos x. So you can see that for this part, generally we can rephrase it sine over cos. So sine over cos, I can rewrite it become tangent. Therefore, we will have 4 tangent x divided by cos x. Alright, so this is how we prove the identity that they want us to show. Alright, then now let us continue further to part B. Okay, so for part number B, they want us to solve this equation for the angle 0 until pi over 2. Okay, so for 0 until pi over 2, uh, generally it means the first quadrant only. Lah. All right. So from the equation that we have, uh, we are having 1 plus sine x, 1 minus sine x, okay, minus 1 minus sine x, 1 plus sine x. Okay, so you can see that this part is actually the left-hand side of the equation that we have in part A. So which means that we have to substitute the result that we get in part A into this equation so that we can solve it, okay, for the... So we are having 4 tangent x divided by cos x equals to 8 tangent x. Alright, so please take note that um, when you want to solve this equation, right, we cannot simplify the tangent x with the tangent x. Because if we simplify it, we might accidentally cancel off some of the possible uh, answer. Alright, so what you can do here is we don't simplify the tangent x but we try to factorize them and group them together. So I multiply the cos x over, and after that I will have 8 tangent x cos x minus 4 tangent x, which is equal to 0. So I can factorize out the 4 tangent x by having 2 cos x minus 1. So from here you can see that I, I have to solve two equations, which is 4 tangent x equals to 0, another one will be cos x equals to half. Alright, so if you accidentally cancel off the tangent x just now, then you might lose or you might have uh, missing one possible answer. Okay, alright, so that's why you cannot simplify the equation, but we have to try and factorize it. Alright, so when you're having tangent x equals to 0, it tells you eventually that x is equal to 0 actually. Alright, and then for cos x equals to half, I will have the answer which is 60 degree. Or if you write in the radian form, it will be pi over 3. 
So that means my final answer, I'm having two answers here. The first one will be x equals to 0. Another one will be pi over 3. Okay, so question 11. Uh, it is given that the gradient of a curve is this. And k is a constant, right? So the curve has a stationary point at 2, negative 3.5. So first, they want us to get the value of k. Okay, so by using the information given here, stationary point at 2 and 93.5. Okay, so to find the stationary point, we will let the dy dx equals to 0, right? So we are having 0 equals to 6 and then 3. x, we will need to substitute by using the value 2, minus 5, power 3 then minus k, 2 squared, x is equal to 2. Alright, so we are having 4k here. Okay, where 4k should be equal to 6, and therefore the k is equal to 3 over 2. Alright, so this is how we get the value for k. Then now we go to the second part. Okay, so for second part, we are having this. They want us to find the equation of the curve. So that means we, will, we want to find the y. La. All right, so to find the y from dy dx, we need to do the diff uh, integration. Okay, so we to get the y, we need to integrate the dy dx where it is 6, 3x minus 5, <coughs> power 3, then minus k. k is 3 over 2 x squared. All right. So from here, I will start the integration. <clears throat> okay, so 6 is a constant, so I will just copy. Then I have 3x minus 5, power plus 1 become 4. So I divided the whole thing by a new power 4. And I also need to differentiate the thing inside the bracket, which is 3x minus 5. Differentiate it, I will get a 3. So I divided it by 3 also at the same time x power 2, when I integrate, become 3, so divided by the new power, and plus c. Okay, so we can try to further simplify it. If I further simplify, I will have 1 over 2, 3x minus 5, power 4, and then for this one, I'm having 1 over x, oh sorry, 1 over 2, x power 3, and plus c. Of course, we need to get the value for c, right? So we will use back the point, the stationary point given in the question part. Okay, so we will substitute x equals to 2, y equals to negative 3.5. Substitute into the equation that we get here and to get the value for c. Alright, so when y equals to negative 3.5 and then the x is half, 3 times 2 is a 6, ah, so 6 minus y is a 1, 1 power 4. Okay, then minus 1 over 2. Um, sorry, yeah. Okay, so maybe I rewrite again. I will have 1 over 2, 1 power 4, minus 1 over 2, uh, 2 power 3. Okay? And then plus C. Okay, so from here, if you try to simplify everything right, you realize that C is equal to 0. So that's why I will rewrite my final equation again, where it will be y equals to half, 3x minus 5 power 4, and minus half x power 3. So this is the equation of the curve. Okay, All right, then now let us proceed further. Okay, now let us proceed further to get this part. Okay, for part number C, they want us to get d square y dx squared, the second derivative of the equation. All right, so uh, to get the second der uh, second derivative of the equation, okay, so I recall back again. Uh, what is our dy dx here? So our dy dx here is actually 6, 3x 
minus 5 power 3, then minus 3 over 2, x squared. Okay, so to get the second derivative, 6 is a constant, you just copy it. The 3 you put in front, right, the power become 3. Copy the bracket, power minus 1 become 2. And after that, you need to differentiate the thing inside the bracket again. So when you differentiate the thing inside the bracket, you are having 3. Then minus 3 over 2 is a constant, you just copy it. And then the 2, when you put in front, become multiplied with your 2. x you copy, and the power minus 1, which is become x, minus, uh, x power 1. Okay, so of course, I will want to further simplify it again. Alright, so I'm having 18 times 3, which is 54. So 54, 3x minus 5 power 2 minus 3x. So this is the second derivative expression that we have. Okay. Alright, then next, we go to the last part, part D. Okay, so for part D. So for part D, they actually want us to determine the nature of the stationary point at this point. So just now we already know that this is a stationary point, And now we want to decide whether is it maximum or minimum. Okay, so to get either is it maximum or minimum, we need to substitute the value of x into our second derivative. So we're having 3 times 2 minus 5 power 2, then minus 3 times 2. Okay, alright, so if you substitute it into the equation, uh, then you'll get 54 minus 6, which is actually 48. Uh. So you can see that 48 is actually greater than 0. So when you're having the second derivative value, which is greater than 0, it means that that particular stationary point is actually a minimum point. Okay, so we can make a conclusion here saying that uh, this particular point is actually a minimum point. Okay, so now we come to the last question, question number 12. Okay, so we are having a diagram and uh, this diagram shows the cross section of seven cylindrical pipes, each of radius 20 cm. And then they are held together by a thin rope which is wrapped tightly around the pipes. So the center of the six outer pipes are A, B, C, D, E, F. So you can see that all the center here are A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. Points P and Q are situated where straight sections of the rope. So we call this as straight sections of the rope. Okay. And then P and Q are the curve. All right. So they actually connect the straight sections of the rope with Q, A, and also the straight, uh, straight sections of the rope with P, A. Okay, so by right, you can see that this is actually a tangent. Alright, so automatically we should know that all these are 90 degrees. Okay. Alright, so first they want us to show the angle PAQ which is equal to pi over 3. Angle PAQ is this one. Alright, so to find the angle PAQ, uh, I will want to actually have a look uh, for this whole diagram here. So this whole diagram, the rope, uh, generally if let's say you extend the rope, into straight line, right? For the P and also from the Q, okay? So if you extend everything here, generally you will see that all these are actually a hexagon, all right? And then I try to label this angle in green color. Okay, so for this angle, all right, the green color angle, it is actually the angle inside the hexagon and we actually name it as the interior angle okay so the green color part is actually the interior angle of a hexagon all right so how are you going to find the interior angle here generally uh, we need to recall back some small formula that we learned before okay which is related to the interior angle of all the polygons all right so we are having hexagon so hexagon here you can see that every side are, are the same so we call it as regular polygons Right, so when we have a shape that is regular, all of the angles are in the same size. So that means all the interior angles that we have uh, 
As an example, for the equilateral triangle, we are having 60 degree for each of the sides. And then the total angle inside the, uh, the polygon will be 180. So for square, each angle will be 90 degree. All right. And then the total for the angle itself for the square will, will be 360 and so on. Okay. So for generally for the hexagon, right? If let's say you are looking for the hexagon, okay, our angle, interior angle will be 120. All right, the total will be 720, but the one angle will be 120. So, which means that uh, our interior angle here, okay, for this particular angle inside the hexagon, it is actually 120, which is equals to 2 pi over 3. All right, okay. So, we have another important information here, like how we get all the angle here actually. So that's a general formula. So the general formula is, uh, they are telling us that if the polygon has n sides, then the angle sum is n minus 2 multiplied with 180. Okay, so this one we maybe learned it before, uh, earlier in secondary school, just that we seldom use it now. So maybe you have to recall it back. Okay, so that you can apply in the coming exam. Right, so we are having n minus 2 times 180, which is the sum, the angle sum. All right, and after that, if you divide the sum by using the n, then you will get the single triangle, uh, sorry, the single angle inside the polygons. Okay, all right, so n minus 2 times 180 is the total, and then if you divide it by the n, that means it is the one single interior angle for that particular polygon. So again, we are having a hexagon in this case, huh? so our one angle will be 120. Okay, all right. Then besides, to continue, right? Okay, so to continue with this shape, I already know that the green color angle is 120. Okay, so now I want to focus on this purple color part. So this purple color part, we are having actually four, four sides. Okay, so the total angle for these four sides will be 360. It is not a square, but it is a polygon with four sides, uh, four sides, right? So it will be 4 minus 2 times 180 to get 360. So that means, okay, for this particular uh, shape in purple color, I'm having the green color angle, which is 120. This angle itself is 90 degree. This is also a 90 degree. All right. So therefore, for part number 8, when you want to get the PAQ, so the angle PAQ, it is actually equals to 2 pi. So 2 pi means um, 360 degree lah, because we are having four sides okay, for this purple color shape. So the total angle inside lah, will be equal to 360, so which is 2 pi. And then minus the green color angle, which is 120 degree, it will become 2 pi over 3. And I also need to minus the two purple color angle here. So both purple color angle is 90 degree each. Uh. So you're having pi over 2 minus pi over 2. So when I'm having 2 pi minus 2 pi over 3 minus pi over 2 minus pi over 2. So eventually for the answer that we get, it should be equals to pi over 3. Alright, so this is how we actually get the answer. Okay, so I hope that you can see clearly here and also can recall back some important information that we learned before. Alright, where the interior angle for the hexagon will be 120 and also for the four sides polygon here, the total angle we have should be 360. So if we take 360 minus all the possible angle that we already know, so we can get the angle PAQ which is equal to pi over 3. Okay, so this is the first part of question that we have. Alright, okay, then now we continue to part number B. Okay, so for part number B, what they want us to calculate is okay, they want us to find the length of the rope. Okay, so to find the length of the rope, generally I will separate into two parts, I'll focus into two parts. Huh? The first part is the um straight sections. So just so the question mentioned, we are having the straight sections, right? So the straight sections means all this. 
All these are the straight sections of the road in red color. So maybe I will label it in red color. Okay, so you're having all the straight sections here. All right, and then this one also. So you are having six straight sections. So for the straight sections, uh, generally, you can see that it is equals to the two times of the radius. Okay, all right. So we are having the straight section, which is equals to two times of radius, which means that it is 40 cm. Okay, all right. So this is 40 cm. This is also the 40 cm for each side. Okay, so besides the straight sections, the rope also consists of the curved section. So the curved section would be this one, something like BQ. Okay, so it will appear for the same thing, okay, for the rest of the diagram. So you can see that we are having six curved sections as well. Okay, so to calculate the length of rope, Generally, we are having six times of the straight sections. Okay, plus six times of the arc, or we can call it as a uh, as a curved section. Uh. So it is actually the arc of a of a sector because PQ is actually an arc. Okay, of the sector PAQ. All right, so six times of the arc. Okay, so 6 times straight sections means that 6 times of the straight section, which is 40 cm each, then plus 6 times of the length of R. So the length of R will be R theta. What is the R? R will be 20 cm. And the theta means the angle of PAQ. So you already know that the angle of PAQ is actually pi over 3. Okay, so from here, if you try to simplify everything, then you will have 240, okay, then plus 4 pi, oh sorry, 40 pi. Okay, so you can keep your answer in this form, in the exact form like this, okay, or if you want, you can further simplify it into three uh, significant figure, which is 366 cm. Alright, so you can leave it either in the exact form or you can change it become three significant figure answer. Right, so this is what we have for part B. Okay, alright, then now we are going to get the part C. Right, so for part C, what do we have? Okay, so for part C, maybe I will move it up here so that you can see the diagram still, see the diagram clearly, alright? Okay, so for part C, they want us to find the area of the hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F, giving your answer in terms of cert 3. Alright, so they want us to have our area, area of hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F. So uh, please take note that where is the area for the A, B, C, D, E, F? So you try to connect all the line A, B, B, C, okay, all the center, you try to connect them with the line. So you can see clearly that you have a red color hexagon in the diagram here. Okay, so they want us to find the area of this hexagon and we want to have our answer in terms of cert 3. Okay, so how can we find the, ang uh, the area of hexagon? Generally, this hexagon uh, we can find out the area by finding out the triangle in this hexagon. So you can see that if I connect the center okay, of the cylindrical pipe uh, in the middle, okay, so it forms actually a triangle here. And for this particular triangle, you can see that it is equilateral triangle because this side is 40 cm, this side is also 40 cm, this side is also 40 cm. So when you're having an equilateral triangle, right, then what happened to the angle here? So the angle here will be 60 degree, which is pi over 3. Okay, so the same thing happened for each side here, right? So you can see that for a hexagon, we are having how many triangles inside? 
So you're having one, two, three. Okay. And then I think very clearly now you can see that there are six are four, five, and six. Okay, so there are six equilateral triangles in the hexagon. Therefore, to calculate the area, right, we are going to use that um, the area is equal to six times of the area of the equilateral triangle. Equilateral triangle. Okay, so to get the area of the equilateral triangle, we will need to have half A, B, sine C. So this is our half. A means one of the sine. Uh, so one of the side here is the length, 40 cm. So another side is this one. This one is also 40 cm. Okay, then sine C. So sine pi over 3 or sine 60 degree. Okay. So if I continue from here, I multiply all the numbers together. I'm having 4,800. And what is the value for sine 60 degree? So according to the triangle that we learned, uh, sine 60 degree will be square root 3 over 2. And if you simplify it, you'll get 2,403. So this is actually the area of the hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F that we have uh, in our diagram here. All right, so this is part C. Okay, then now we still have one last part, which is part D. Okay, so for part D, okay, I need to, I need to bring it up. Okay, so for part D, now they want us to calculate, all right, the area of the complete region and close by the road. Okay, so uh, now they want us to find out the total area inside the road. Okay, so if you uh, try to figure out uh, all the area inside the road, right, it actually consists of the area of the hexagon A, B, C, D, A, F, which is the answer that we find in part number C. So besides this hexagon, okay, what else? What, what what are the areas that we need to include uh, so that it covers the whole region and close by the road? Okay, so now I'm trying to draw. I assume that the hexagon, okay, the hexagon here, we already have the area. So it is also consists of six rectangle area. Okay, this is one, one rectangle. And then we are having a second rectangle here in green color. Okay, then the third rectangle. Okay, if you try to draw like, all this in the uh, straight sections, huh, you can see that all these are actually the triangle and all of them are the same. Okay, so we are having six triangles in total. Okay, I hope that you all can see it, all right, in green color part. Okay, huh? so this is the uh, rectangle. So for each of the rectangle, right, the area is base times height. So the base will be 40 cm and then the height will be the radius, which is 20 cm. Okay, so besides the hexagon and also the rectangle shown in green color, and we also need to include, all right, another area the remaining area which is in purple color okay so the purple color one will be this one the remaining area is actually the sector area of sector paq and you can see that there are six same sector okay if i can draw the diagram nicely okay then you can see that all the six sectors here are actually the same in purple color Okay, so there are three parts we need to include actually. So to calculate the area in the rope and close by the rope. Okay, we are having three types of shapes. Okay, that means that we are having the area hexagon, hexagon, A, B, C, D, E, F. 
that we already calculated just now in part C, plus six times of rectangle, okay, then plus six times of the area of sector. Okay, so the rectangle is in green color, and then the sector will be in the purple color. Okay, so I hope that you can see it clearly here. All right, so now to get the area of hexagon, the answer straight away you can get it from part number C, which is 2,433 plus 6 times of the rectangle. So the rectangle, area of rectangle will be 40 times 20. So 40 times 20, then plus 6 sector. So what is the formula for the sector here? It will be half r square so my r is 20 so 20 square half r square theta so the theta again is the angle paq so paq is actually pi over 3 all right so after you include all these values here you can try to simplify it slowly where you will get 2400 100 sub 3 then plus 4,800 plus 400 pi. Okay, so you can leave your answer in this form, which is actually the uh, exact form. All right, so I keep my answer in exam form. Or another option is if you want, you can change it, become three significant answer. So the three significant figure answer will be 10200. Zero, zero, zero. Okay, so again, the area enclosed by the rope, it consists of three parts. First part is the red color hexagon. Second part is the six times of the rectangle area. And also the third part will be six times of the area of the sector. So that it forms the complete uh, area enclosed by the rope. All right, so here we ended our video okay, for this paper. Thank you very much for watching.